Coming up on this episode of Omnivore, replicating smell with nanotechnology, climate threats to the Mediterranean diet, and political headwinds facing food traceability. It's episode 43 of Omnivore, from the editors of Food Technology Magazine and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by Calsec. Visit calsec.com to uncover new ways to create clean products that look better, taste better, and last longer, naturally, with Calsec. Welcome to Omnivore from IFT and Food Technology, where we explore the intersection of business, science, and technology in the global food system. I'm Bill McDowell. New Zealand-based tech manufacturer Ascension Bio won the startup pitch competition at the recent IFT First annual event and expo this summer and took home a $10,000 grand prize in the process. Ascension Bio is a technology company that combines insect biology with nanotechnology and sensor devices. These handheld devices mimic insect odorant receptors to analyze a sample and then uses machine learning to interpret the results. Food Technology Associate Editor Emily Little spoke with CEO Jonathan Good about potential applications in food and beverage production. Jonathan, thank you for joining me today, and I'm really excited to talk about Sentium Bio. Thanks so much for having me, Emily. So can you tell me a bit about Sentient Bio and this new technology that you've helped develop? Sure. So we're, um, so we're a biosensor company and we're helping um, digitize smell and taste by providing new measurement tools with our biosensor. Uh, so the origins of the company are in um, studying how insects smell and taste because they have these absolutely incredible abilities. And so we have developed the ability to synthesize the proteins that they use and then embed those in a small handheld sensor. Uh, And then we use machine learning to be able to interpret the signal and provide a real-time measure on the chemical composition of a sample. And why insects specifically? Why was that the thing that really inspired all of this? Uh, Two reasons. So firstly, we're a spin out from um, from the elite government research lab here in New Zealand called Plant and Food Research. Uh, and so starting from, from horticulture, um, obviously there's a lot of interest in insects as pests. Um, so that's part of the origin story. But the other part is, um, is the fact that insects just have this incredible ability. And as humans, 89% of the information we get is visual. You know, we see the world and experience the world through our eyes. Um, for insects, it's the reverse. Their experience is predominantly um, smell um, and taste, and that gives them crazy abilities. So, a uh, like a bee can um, can smell a blooming flower two kilometers away, and you know this these things that seem beyond belief. A silkworm moth will follow a, a pheromone trail for love to find a mate for thirty miles, um, and so you know the other reason is because there's this absolutely incredible ability that we as humans don't have, but that we can harness from nature and and mimic and create these incredible tools that enable us to do things that we never thought were possible. That's incredible. And I remember at the pitch, you had the sensor in your hand. It's pretty small. It sure is. It's, um, I mean, obviously the folks on the podcast can't see it, but here's, (laughs) here's one in my hand here. It's about, I don't know, half the size of my iPhone, just as a sort of common reference. Yeah. And how does that, you know, add to its appeal being so small? Yeah, I think the, um, you know, small is, is part of this, um, the magic of it can go anywhere um, and it can be used where you want to do it because um, as, I, I mean, as listeners in the food industry, when I'm measuring stuff in food is, is, uh, is necessary today, but it's, it's very difficult, right? Because in general, you have to take samples away. And so the, the game changer here is when it's, small and mobile, you can take testing to where you want to do testing. And for, you know, operations and supply chain, that's transformative. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's the real, I mean, it's it's cool that you can carry it around, but the, the great thing is that that means you can do testing where you want to do it. That's great what you said about you normally have to send things out and then that adds time to your timeline. Whereas if you bring it in, there's a real chance to cut that down. Yeah, exactly. And um, and you can get an immediate result. So you don't have to worry about what to do while you're in some, you know, holding period and storing things away and 
wonder, worrying about release because if we can deliver a result in a couple of minutes, um, then you can instantly make a decision on where where that product's going and um, and yeah, unlock a lot of the headaches that that folks in operation and supply chain experience today. So I think you answered this a bit, but I just want to go back to it. What kind of problems do you think Centene Bio can help solve for the food value chain? Yeah, I think um, you know, there's three different kinds of problems we're, we're working on in our um, pilots at the moment. Um, so the first of those is around uh, quality control, you know, for inputs and raw ingredients all the way through to, to finished goods. Um, and the second is around tanks and residues, and the third is around measuring key ingredients. So in the in the first instance. You know, particularly um, for high value food ingredients and flavors, um, obviously there's lots of variability that um, people are trying to manage. And um, at the moment, yeah, I mean, mass spec is probably the go-to or otherwise the variability goes through the supply chain and you get all the, the challenges and disputes that go with that. And so we're providing a definitive view at each step along the supply chain around what the composition looks like and whether it's in spec to try and Make sure that things are what they say they are. Um, and then in the in the second instance around um, tanks and residues, there's um, obviously a lot of pressure coming through from consumers and regulators um, to make sure that you know products don't have other things in them. Um, and so we can um, we can provide fast and simple tests for um, tanks. We can um, check for residues from um, from some pesticides and um, look for other sort of you know, damage and collection that might have occurred through the supply chain um, to help make to help provide assurance. And you know, I think our um, pilot customers are seeing that as a as a differentiator to their customers. Um, and then the the third one is around you know, measuring key ingredients, where um, particularly in, in natural derived ingredients, um, making sure like you know what the content level is of the the thing that people really care about, um, and we can provide a, a nice fast measure on that as well. That's incredible. So obviously you are our grand prize winner. Congratulations once again. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I feel very honored. It was a, a, an incredible set of startups. So um, yeah, kudos and the acknowledgement to the, the other great startups doing awesome work as well. I always get so inspired walking through the startup pavilion and so excited. You can just feel their energy. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think it's um it's a very exciting time in the in the food industry. It's, you know, innovation the whole way through from yeah the startup pavilion, but lots of great innovation coming through uh, the wider industry and um and the surrounding academia as well. So, what are your plans for the prize money that you've received? Yeah, so we're um you know we still uh very um, aspirational in terms of what more we can do with our. Uh, with our platform, so there's a lot of um, further development and product work that we're um, we're looking towards, and, and the money all helps with that. So, um, being able to provide for different formats, different um, you know ways that this might be extended in the future to um, other um, opportunities, and I mean another great part about um, IFT First was hearing from customers the breadth of things that they'd love to um, be engaged in, and you know some of those things require a bunch more investigation. So it, it just all helps with us in terms of our, our work in the lab and research and development to further the, the platform. That's great. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much once again for chatting with me and good luck. Thanks very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Jonathan Good is the CEO of Sension Bio with experience as an entrepreneur and senior leader in several global food businesses. You can learn more about this year's pitch competition and other highlights from the IFT First event in the September issue of Food Technology. We'll be back with more Omnivore in a moment, but first, this word from our sponsor. Ready to discover what's naturally possible? Food and beverage brands are uncovering new ways to create clean products that look better, taste better, and last longer, naturally, with CalSec. Since 1958, Calsex food scientists have been helping brands transform their products with technology for natural color, elevated flavors, and safer extended shelf lives. As dedicated partners, Calsec is there to guide you the whole way. Visit their website at calsec.com to connect with the Calsec team and find your path to natural products 
your customers will love and trust. Welcome back to Omnivore. I'm Bill McDowell. For decades, the Mediterranean diet has been promoted as one of the world's healthiest. But the once stable climates that support key ingredients like olives, tree nuts, and even some fish species are now facing severe disruptions from record-breaking temperatures to widespread droughts and wildfires. Food and sustainability consultant Arlen Wasserman argues these challenges not only threaten the availability of these essential foods, but also foreshadow broader challenges for global nutrition and food security. I recently caught up with Arlen to discuss how a changing environment could reshape the way we think about diet and food production. Arlen, it's great to see you again. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Bill. It's great to be talking with you again as well. You know, as we record this in mid-August, the timing of this discussion is eerily relevant. I mean, we've been seeing stories coming out of Greece all summer about record-breaking temperatures. Um, just this week, there are these really intense wildfires burning in the northern suburbs of Athens. Your recent op-ed points to the connection between these climate events and long-term climate change, and specifically the implications on the Mediterranean diet. So briefly recap what that connection is and what you see as some of the implications of it. Thanks. And, you know, some of us also have short-term memories. So while we're sitting here in August talking about the fires in Athens, a year ago, cruise ship passengers were being evacuated from the coast of Spain and Portugal because of fires and unprecedented heat. And in the Mediterranean region, this past June and July were the two hottest months ever. Last year, June and July were the two hottest months ever until this year. And if we think about that in the Mediterranean diet, there's two things that are going on and they're kind of headed in opposite directions. One of them is it's hard to go to any mainstream nutrition conference or food and health conference and not hear health professionals recommend that people eat the Mediterranean diet. And the PREDIMED study, which was this enormous study meant to document exactly where those benefits come from by comparing and contrasting the dietary choices of people of all different ages living in the Mediterranean, kept coming back and saying, the things that caused the biggest benefit were olives, olive oil, made from olives, and tree nuts, with also some additional contribution from eating more fish, especially smaller fish, than we do here in the US. Now, olives and olive oil, along with a couple other things like wine grapes, really only grow in five regions in the world. They're called Mediterranean growing regions because they have climates like the Mediterranean. They're coastal, cooler nights, warmer summers. Napa, California is another one of those. You know, any place you can think of good wine, Australia, South Africa, places in China. Now, those five regions are also on the front lines of climate change. You could almost think of them as the canary in the coal mine because their climate, their weather is so precise that when it gets a little unstable, it's the first to show in a lot of different ways, whether it's fires because precipitation is low in them or it's a poor harvest. And so if you look back over the past five, 10 years, it's really hard to not find a year where two or three of those regions are in severe drought and one or two of them is on fire. Might be a little hard to navigate through burning fires to harvest your olives or, or uh, tree nuts. Um, might be hard to get a workforce there, especially if you think about lower paid or migrant labor. And there could be smoke taint, which really affects quality. The other thing to think about is the long-term implications. Public health and nutrition professionals are recommending that people eat more and more or more and more people eat the very crops that are getting harder and harder to grow. And that simply is not tenable. So, you know, what 
to what degree do you see this as foreshadowing of what's to come in terms of global nutrition and the broader discussion around food security? So you, you, you open up a really big question. If you think about people who are living closer to the land or closer to the next week's pay and have a certain way of eating, it is a huge disruption to society. One of the examples that I think about a lot, and we might not remember this in detail, is a lot of us remember the Arab Spring, when the government of Egypt and then several other governments uh, turned over due to popular uprising. And if you were a close watcher of what was going on in Egypt before the public protests, wheat became too expensive. There was a global wheat shortage. Russia stopped exporting because they wanted to keep all their wheat for domestic use. We had low yields in the US. And while a big food company could buy wheat to make their frozen pizza or their snack chips, they were right pushing the price so high by playing on the global market that they priced it out of the reach of everyday Egyptian citizens who were looking forward to their pita flatbreads and use wheat extensively on their diet, things like bulgur. And so when the government couldn't deliver wheat, the government collapsed. What do you see food professionals, the food industry doing in response to this? I mean, are we at a point where we need to really be starting to think about diversifying the crops and ingredients that we're using to support the diets, to support the, the, the products? So I'll break this down into three different things that we can do as professionals. Um, depending on where you sit in the industry and the profession or in your company, you might just do one of these things. So one of them is if you have the privilege of recommending what people eat, it's a dicey proposition in terms of affordability, pricing people out of traditional foods and impact on diet and the planet. If you place your bets on only one single thing, one of the simple things we can do is recommend several of them at once. Don't say there's absolutely one thing we all need to eat next year. Say there's four or six or eight. This both raises the odds that some of those will be available and also reduces the pressure on buying up the last whatever in a community that relies on it. The second thing is we need to be more in touch, not only with the farmer, but with the weather. Now, we've talked a lot about seasonal eating. You know, it's strawberry season, it's asparagus season, it's apple season, it's peach season. Well, peach season doesn't always occur the right way every year. But what we do know is that technology lets us know far ahead of time, 9, 10, 12 months, what the harvest is likely to be like. We have long-range weather forecasts. We have ground-penetrating radar that can tell us how much groundwater or soil moisture retention there is. So if you're running a big company that might be a restaurant or a grocery store, and you have the ability to buy so much food that you are making the market, you might want to have a series of recipes that make sense if it's a dry year, if it's a wet year, if it's a hot year, if it's a year with that's forecast for heavy winds and rains, so that you have a few things that you're going to buy three, six, nine months out, and then you're encouraging farmers to plant something that's appropriate rather than forcing them to plant something that's difficult to grow, which can result in driving down groundwater or introducing chemicals that can affect the soil health or the, or the local habitat. The last thing is um, we are really focusing a lot on preservation technologies that are carbon friendly and preserve flavor and nutrients. And when you look at those, you know, there is freezing and refrigeration. Unfortunately, those can have large carbon footprints, including when you ship the products. And canning can, affect, uh, unfortunately, affect flavor and nutrition to a certain extent. But that ability to preserve food for a couple of years so that you get the flavors and the nutrients, I think is our short-term play. That bridges one or two bad growing seasons. If we have three, four, or five, it's a whole different game. It's time to think about something else to eat. Are there other growing regions around the world that you see in some cases where the center of gravity shifts 
uh, into some of these other regions and they start to take on different roles uh, in terms of their ability to support some of these crops? I wish I could say yes, but I'm going to say that move won't be a good one for the planet long term. So if you think about moving, um, farming that occupies hundreds of thousands of acres to someplace else, you might be talking about cutting down a forest or a rainforest. When the U.S. soy harvest became a little uncertain, Brazil cut down its rainforests, which had a huge impact on climate change and habitat. So I want to challenge us as professionals to diversify our ingredients and be able to adjust not on a two or three year plan, but on an eight to 12 month basis, what it is we want to use as inputs or menu items. Agricultural planning can only move us so far before we say, let's eat what is readily available and grows rep easily, rather than forcing us to turn another part of the world into what used to be Napa or Greece. So as we look ahead, how do you see all of this impacting either the relationship of or the focus of some of the different areas of the food sciences? What kinds of collaborations uh, should we be prioritizing? So I think where we need to go, as I mentioned before, one is in preservation technologies to pr uh, protect nutrition and flavor and result in a product that has a relatively small energy or carbon footprint, not frozen or refrigerated, and can bridge a bad growing season or two. That's how we keep things the way they are now. Information technology that links forecasts about what will grow with ordering or menuing is another play that uses tools we already have in new ways. And the last thing is our ability to synthesize nutrients. And I know that at IFT's conference this year, last year, we're looking a lot at precision fermentation and where we can harvest biological means to produce the healthy fats that used to be in olive oil or omega-3s that are declining as we move towards not only fish farming, but challenges in getting high quality feed for those farmed fish. You know, all of these, th I, I think precision fermentation and maybe a few other allied technologies that get us the nutrients we can reincorporate in food will be important. Arlen Wasserman is the founder and managing director of Changing Tastes, where he consults with companies to identify and catalyze shifts in the way businesses and consumers think about food. You can read more of his thoughts on the connection between climate change and diet in the September issue of Food Technology. IFT members can also participate in the discussion at our member forum, IFT Connect. Frank Giannis is a fan of the famous W. Edward Deming quote, In God we trust, all others bring data. But the well-known food safety and traceability champion puts his own twist on it, saying, in God We Trust, all others get on the blockchain. During his career at Walt Disney World, Walmart, and most recently as FDA's Deputy Commissioner for Food Policy and Response, Giannis has been one of the most vocal advocates for transparency and traceability in the supply chain. Whether it's distributed ledger technology like blockchain or other tech-enabled traceability solutions, he believes that the systematic approach that FDA has enacted through its food traceability role is a big step forward in protecting public health and also good for business. Food Technologies' Julie Larson Brisher recently spoke with Giannis to get his thoughts on recently proposed legislation, which he says could delay or even gut the food traceability role, which is scheduled to begin in January 2026. Well, it's always an awesome day when I get to talk to you, Frankie Honest. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on with you again. All right. Well, let's dive right in today's topic, traceability. Um, you know, we're fewer than 20 months away from this implementation deadline for the food traceability rule. What, what's your assessment of how companies are doing to prepare? And are there any surprises or unanticipated challenges? 
Well, thanks, Julie. That's that's a great question. Uh, I'll get to that, but very quickly, let me just remind your listeners on why we're having this conversation and why traceability is important. You know, I've been working in the food system, as you know, for a long time now, and I like to say the food system is really impressive, but it does have this one Achilles heel. And that for me has been over the course of my career, a lack of traceability and transparency. We've seen this in outbreak over outbreak, right? You can think back to outbreaks that gave us FISMA. But even today, you see the almost daily or weekly recalls and outbreaks that are happening as we speak, listeria and deli meats, what retailers did it end up in. We've seen kids poisoned with lead, with retailers not pulling that product off for a very long time. So traceability matters because it's extremely protective to public health. Uh, How did we get here? Well, uh, some of your readers will remember we've been on this journey for a while. When Congress passed the Food Safety Modernization Act in 2010, and it was signed into law by President Obama in January 2011, there was always provisions or directions that FDA should write a rule. The FDA wrote the rule, and now we find ourselves facing a food traceability rule compliance date right around the corner of January 2026. I talk to the folks in the food industry regularly, every day. And what I would say, Julie, is that I've seen more progress made on food traceability in the past year than I have in the past decade. And it's been part of my life's work. Uh, You have a large decentralized and distributed food system. A lot of nodes, farmers, producers, processors, distributors are working to try to comply with the rule. They're putting plans in place. The rule itself, people understand the rule. People have a good understanding of what foods are on the food traceability list. They have an understanding of these concepts that are important, key data elements, critical tracking events. And so we're out well on our journey. But I would tell you that that last mile, what happens at distribution and how those traceability lock codes get captured from DC to point of service, which is included in the rule, is probably the hardest part of this. And so that's where I think you see still a little bit of opportunity, a little bit of concern. But by and large, the industry has gotten started. We're making progress. And my message to the listeners is now is not a time to slow down. And let's let's finish the job we've started. Right, right. Well, what about this HR 7536, uh, which is known as the Food Traceability Enhancement Act? Um, What's in the bill, and what would be the practical impact of this on the traceability rule, and what's the rationale? Yeah, I'm glad you asked me that, because I watch that with great interest. So uh, there's a few representatives in the House that introduced this bill called the Food Traceability Enhancement Act. Uh, I've called it in the public domain and in the trade press the Food Traceability Destruction Act not the Enhancement Act. And let me explain why I feel that way. Uh, The bill says two things specifically. Number one, it asks uh, FDA and the industry to do 12 more pilots on food traceability, three at food service, three at retail, three at distribution, uh, and there's another three that need to be done for a totality of 12. And in particular, it says that FDA, once you do these pilots, then we would allow you to enforce a a compliance date two years thereafter. So in essence, it delays the rule with the need to do pilots. The second thing it does is there's language that says, FDA, you would not be allowed to actually do uh, required traceability lock codes at distribution centers and at point of service, grocery stores and food service. So my view of the rule is that if you don't require traceability lock codes, you in essence gut the rule. You won't be able to do true public health tracebacks. I can say this with confidence and authority, Julie, because I was at FDA overseeing the food outbreak and response process. And I can tell you that we can identify clusters or illnesses associated with either shopping at a grocery store or dining at a restaurant. The most difficult thing we have to do is even if we identify a food vehicle is what lot number And where do you start a traceback? Without that, the traceback requests are very broad and they're not specific. So without a traceability lock code, talk to anybody that's really had to do traceback investigations during a a real pressure type scenario. I mean, when you're responsible to try and identify the food that's making people sick and maybe even causing harm and death, 
that's a lot of responsibility on your shoulders. And we know anybody that's done that knows that having a traceability lock code makes a world of difference. And there's examples where it's made the difference between just pulling a product quickly and protecting additional consumers and not having to do these overly broad recalls. The other thing is if you strike the requirement to capture a traceability lock code at distribution, you actually are taking two steps back because today most distributors can receive a lot code. They're just not capturing or tracking that lot code to the point of service, to the restaurant, or to the retailer. But if you just strike that completely, the reality is that's the equivalent of taking steps back. So I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, I don't think it's going to go anywhere. Uh, consumer groups have come out, come out, as you know, and been very vocal about it. And they've dubbed it the Food Traceability Evisceration Act. I call it the Food Traceability Distression Act. Maybe well-intended. I don't know. I think we all could have a little empathy on maybe you need a little bit more time. Uh, but to gut to rule, I don't think anybody is willing to actually entertain that. Right. Uh, well, now, what's your sense of public or political support for or against this bill? Is And has there been any research to reflect this? Well, uh, it's a really good question because at the end of the day, I like to say whether you work in the private sector, meaning working for a company, a food producer, or food distributor, whether you work in the public sector, your state regulatory agency or FDA, C- CDC or USDA, or if, you know, if congressional leaders have skin in this game too, I think at the end of the day, we can say we're all working for the same boss, the American consumer. And I love this question, Julie, because as we have these discussions and some would even say debate, the question is, where's the consumer in all of this? There are bosses. What do they think? So uh, I'm pleased to report that I actually influenced a survey recently through Harris Poll that are really masters at conducting polling. And we ask American consumers this question. Uh, If you know Harris Poll as an organization, they don't let you do cheesy polls. One could do a poll that gets the answer that you want. So for example, if we asked Americans, should your grocery store be able to trace foods back to source? I think they would all say yes. (laughs) But this poll was conducted academically and with integrity, and they asked consumers the right question. You know, they educated consumers. There's a rule that's going to go into effect of January 2026. Some people think it's too hard. Uh, And then they asked consumers to say, do you think FDA should go through with enforcement of the rule on January 2026, or do you agree that the industry needs more time to comply? And it's not surprising, the majority of American consumers, uh, uh, 52%, said, hey, we think the rule should go into effect in January 2026. I think it was 23% said, maybe we should grant a little bit more time. Uh, the others just weren't really clear. But on a ratio of two to one, the American consumer wants food traceability and they want this rule in particular going to effect. That voice needs to be heard because consumers expect this and they want it. Um, that's the only, the only real study I've seen. Uh, I think by and large industry, a lot in industry understand that there's a real return on investment on this. And some people are on this journey, Julie, not just because of compliance with the rule, but they've seen the return on investment when you run more transparent and traceable supply chains, generally you can improve operational efficiency, you can reduce shrink. And so, um, but the voice of the consumer has not been elevated. And I can tell you when you ask the American public, they want this rule. Yeah, well, what do you, what do you anticipate is going to happen next? Uh, you know, what's your vision for the future? And are there ways for the food science community to get involved? Yeah, so uh, the food science community, I would say, yeah, they should get involved. Number one is the food science community plays a critical role in continued modernization of the food system. I always say, you know, food security is national security. There's not too many topics more important than our ability to continue to modernize and make the food system the best that it can be. And I think leveraging, you know, Principles of traceability and transparency to the extent that we enable it with technology is, is good for the future of food in terms of safety, efficiency, sustainability. So the, the food science community should continue to advocate for greater traceability and transparency. I would say we should continue to insist and develop standards so that this big and decentralized food system can work smarter together. 
And the food science community, I think, plays a real critical role in testing and scaling some of these concepts. So um, I would advocate that all of my colleagues in the food science community community should get involved. Uh, Where does this go next? It's a great question because I don't know about you. You see all of the debate and uncertainty in the political system. And part of this is involving rulemaking, a rule that exists, but the desire by some to actually influence or change the rule. And I've learned that I try not to predict what Congress might do. But if I were to go out on a limb, I don't think the Food Traceability Enhancement Act will go anywhere. Um, What I have seen is that through the congressional appropriations process, we've seen a subcommittee in the House uh, develop language on appropriations because FDA gets their funding for food through congressional appropriations, not user fees. Uh, the House language was pretty strict, directing FDA to actually do some additional pilots and potentially delay the rule. If you look at the Senate language and the Senate subcommittee on appropriations for FDA, that language is very different. In fact, I think it said we advise or recommend that FDA do additional pilots. So it's very soft language. I don't think anybody's thinking that we'll get some type of uh, reconciliation package through Congress anytime soon. So. Uh, I, I don't see the food traceability rule going away. Now, I do think there's a win-win. I'll say this. As I watch this political season, what I think about food traceability is that food traceability shouldn't divide us. It should unite us. I, I'll, I'll repeat that to your listeners because I can't stress how true I think this principle is. We shouldn't be debating food traceability. It shouldn't be dividing us. We should all be united around a more traceable food system is good for everyone. Uh, the agency, meaning the FDA, does the, have the capability to grant enforcement discretion. Uh, they've done it before. We did it when I was at the agency, which is you have a rule with a compliance date. If people are working, they're making progress, they haven't sought perfection yet, is you grant enforcement discretion, meaning you, we're not going to come out heavy-handed you know, after, after the compliance date and allow a period of time for people to continue to make progress on the journey. So I think, you know, I would hope that the agency would really be open to signaling that, you know, it always has had the ability to grant enforcement discretion as long as people are making good faith effort. The other win-win, I think, is, you know, Congress has directed the agency to say, why don't you consider doing some additional pilots? A lot of us, Julie, really don't have an appetite for more pilots. IFT actually helped do the first pilots that were done right after FISMA was passed. There's been a lot of pilots, some that I've participated in in the past few years. When I was at FDA, we did the food traceability challenge. But if we did some pilots really scoped around what are the remaining friction or pain points, which is that last mile, that might be useful and informing. But bottom line message I want your your readers and listeners to know is that The traceability train, fortunately, positively has left the station, and I don't think it stops. Thank you for your insight today, Frank. I really appreciate having you on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Well, thank you for bringing up a topic. You know that um, it's a topic that's near and dear to me because of my lifetime of experiences of a lack of transparency in the food system, and I can speak to it hopefully with credibility, having been on both sides of the fence in the public and private sector. Thank you for uh, elevating this important conversation and uh, let's get on with this. We can do this as a food system. Frank Giannis is the former Deputy Commissioner for Food Policy and Response at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, where he was the principal advisor on food safety policies. As the founder of Innovative Food Consulting, he focuses on building food safety management systems in elevating food safety standards around the world. Check out the August issue of Food Technology for more on how the food industry is building its traceability tech stacks. Thank you to this episode's sponsor, CalSec. Visit calsec.com. That's K-A-L-S-E-C.com. To connect with the CalSec team and find your path to natural products your customers will love and trust. And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine, 
or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org membership. For more in-depth discussion about innovation in the science of food, check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of ift.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. The address is editors at ift.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening, and join us again for our next episode.